in 15 minutes, I need to summarize this whole book that I wrote with uh, Laura Parker, from, uh, a reporter for the New York Times. And more than that, I'm going to try to convert you in 15 minutes that video games are not only the most dominant medium of the century, they're actually pretty good. They can do good in the world. Um, and we're going to go back in time. This is how we'll start. And then we'll go into the future. We'll talk about a little game about peace. So going back to where I started with all this, um, I uh, grew up in Tel Aviv. Um, it's such a small place that, I mean, Israel is a country that the dot is covering like three neighboring countries. And if you live in Tel Aviv, you live in, in what Israel is believed is a bubble. You know, they have amazing nightlife, beaches. It's this uh, Barcelona-like city. But at the end of the day, my argument is that the bubble has cracks, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not that uh, shielded. This is a drawing I made when I was five years old. My mother kept it. And now I, have, I can compare because I have kids at that age. And my daughters are drawing princesses and trees and flowers. And this is what I did, national symbols and the conflict. Because this is what you have around you. And even if you try very hard to avoid it, come the age of 18, you're going to the army. If you didn't recognize, I'm this guy. And you go to the army. Men need to do it for three years. Women do it for two years. In my case, I did it for five because I was a captain in the intelligence corps. And that was also a, a kind of a game. And I think it influenced a lot what you'll see very soon, the, the first video game that I ever made. Um, it's kind of a game because you have those small wins. Um, then you realize that there are small wins, but they're not really changing the big picture. Um, it's very thrilling. But then I left everything, and I felt that I, I need some meaning, that what I'm doing there is, uh, is not enough. And I went on a journey from one small place to another. And I met this guy. Anybody can uh, shout the name? Pausch. Randy Pausch, right. Randy Pausch of the last lecture. I don't have enough time to speak about him, so put a bookmark. Really recommend those of you who didn't watch it. It's uh, the last lecture that he had. He knew that he's about to die. He had uh, something, at that time, something like three months to live. He was 46, and he wanted to convince the audience that he achieved all his childhood dreams by the age of 46, and he's going on you know, complete and, uh, and content. And uh, he was my teacher. And he was the guy that opened the program that I went in Carnegie Mellon to, at the Entertainment Technology Center. And I'm coming to Randy and Don, who was the co-founder, and I'm telling them, guys, I'm coming from Israel. I served in the army. I did some tech. I want to make a video game about peace in the Middle East. The year is 2004. Perception of video games, the worst ever. You can't Im imagine something worse. Um, it's before Facebook, before mobile. So video games are really about consoles and teenagers playing in the basement with the open pizza boxes. And I want to make not only a game about the Middle East, but one that is about peace in the Middle East. They, you can actually reach into an agreement between the two sides. The response is this, but we worked very hard to, to convince them and convince the faculty that we're serious. I think that what helped is also that I was so old compared to the other students. And they were like, you know, maybe this guy has some experience and we can let him do it. Super ambitious. Turned out, uh, just a second, turned out into a project that I'm going to show you a video. We sold it in 60 countries. We started a company uh, from a modest university project with a lot of press that you'll see. And, you know, I'm showing it to you because it was one of the first games that came out with this concept and got some attention to the idea that Video games could actually be pretty serious. And like any other medium, they can convey real messages. So I'm going to show you a short video and we'll continue.
Peacemaker is a game in which you take the role of one of the leaders. You can take either the role of the Israeli Prime Minister or the Palestinian President. You can play both perspectives. And the idea is that as the leader, you have to react to real-time events happening in the world. You can negotiate with other leaders, but you also have security or military actions that you can take. And by doing so, you have to reach a peaceful solution while in office. In an Israeli high school, a new computer game called Peacemaker was launched today. Children playing the role of Israeli and Palestinian leaders trying to make peace in a virtual world of suicide bombings and Israeli military strikes. We don't expect to address all issues of the conflict. We don't expect to give all the answers. We're bringing up issues for discussion. I think the best aspect of playing this game is that, especially if you're a Palestinian student in the territories or an Israeli student within Israel, you, you get a chance to really feel what both sides are thinking and get a better sense of what they can do together to work towards peace. If you look at the video game industry today, there are so many games out there about violence, about war, about destructions. We say a simple thing, there is certainly a place for one little game about peace. Okay, th this is me, uh, very young and naive. Um, but what I wanted to say about the game, it had, I think, three very cool ideas. One is the idea that you could play both sides, and they were completely different. One side has all the resources, one side doesn't. Um, it was in three languages, uh, Arabic, English, and Hebrew, something that was pretty unique. And the other thing, you saw the real footage. So we were the first video game, I don't know how many did it since then, that licensed uh, real footage from Reuters. And when we came to them, they didn't even know what to do with it, how, how to model it. But we actually took all those photos and videos and decided to put them into the game rather than go for 3D. Um, what did we do with Peacemaker? First of all, um, we got a lot of people trying it, including politician, politicians. Uh, I said that we got it out into the consumer market, but we also got some interesting experiment. one, one, experiments. One of them was uh, I got a call by Channel 2, Prime TV in Israel, and they said, are you willing for uh, Danny Atom to play the game on live um, in the evening? And I said, sure. Um, I hope he's not making a mistake, which, which he surely did. And, um, and back then, he was a, a prime minister candidate. He was the ex-head of the Mossad in Israel. He was also part of the Israeli-Palestinian delegation. And he played the game, and he lost... In how long? Any guess? Five minutes. So I'm going to show you a short clip. It's in Hebrew, so you're not going to understand much. But he's basically narrating it. And he's playing Peacemaker. He's making some choices. The first thing he saw is a suicide bomb. It's like the inciting incident. So he apparently feels very, um, you know, kind of eager to return in military actions. At one point, the reporter is saying, man, you know, it's a, it's a peace game. I mean, maybe you <laughs> try to exercise some diplomacy. And he does, but the diplomacy he's exercising is demand concessions from the other side. And then he loses. You saw the third intifada coming on screen. And the reporter is saying, what do you think about the game? He said, completely unrealistic, because I did all the right things. <laughs> so we understood that politicians are probably not, uh, we're not going to change that. We went for kids, and we had an amazing uh, collaboration with the Perez Center. Shimon Perez, the late uh, president of Israel, and um, they bought from us 100,000 copies, which were distributed in the West Bank and Israel. And until this day, they're doing uh, workshops with students. And the interesting things, thing about it is that Peacemaker many times is the only opportunity for them to speak about the conflict. Because they don't speak about it in the curriculum. They're not speaking about it with the teachers. It's very sensitive. But the game creates this safe environment for the discussion. Um, from there, I moved to Games for Change, which is the community for people, developers, and you know, it's, it's much like PopTech. We have this event every year, and we're trying to put this platform for exchange of ideas and resources. And um, we have heroes, we have our own heroes. And what the book does, I'm not going to describe them now, what the book does is trying to highlight those pioneers. And some of you, you'll be very surprised to know that among them is Supreme Court Justice O'Connor. 
that made an amazing project for civic education with video games? Or a Saudi prince that made a game for women empowerment two years ago? Uh, scientists, brain scientists. But again, I'm not talking about that. We'll talk about the future. So what's next? Um, I'm, I, I want to highlight um, three trends that I believe in video games, especially video games for social impact, are going to be super meaningful. One is neurogaming. How many of you heard about neurogaming? Okay, we have a few. So this is a very new idea in games for impact and games for change. Usually we thought about video games that you play and then you reflect on your experience and something happens, right? Just like you watch a documentary uh, or maybe you learn something as a result of the experience. With brain games, uh, uh, neuro games, and, and just to clarify, these are very different than the drill, the brain drilling games that you, you hear about in the commercial world. These are not that. These are games developed by uh, some of the top uh, brain scientists in the country. And one of those, a game by Adam Gazelli that uh, proved in a, a, a clinical trials that he can fight mental decline with a video game, as in, unlike what I described earlier, real-time change of the brain structure is going now to FDA approval. And he calls it digital medicine. So the idea is that if he's successful and he's very close to achieving that goal, uh, and he's not the only one, Doctors could prescribe a video game for patients. They'll give them a tablet, and they'll tell them, instead of taking medicine, play this game four times a week for one hour a session over a month. And he proved that the impact could last for six months, so the positive impact. Test out a virtual reality. I want to, to show you something that is kind of related in virtual reality. Virtual reality also opens new horizons for us because of the immersion, because of the idea that you are much more immersed in the experience of a game or, or interactivity. What I'm going to show you now is a tool used by the US Army and also a tool that went through clinical trials and is meant to help uh, burn victims, uh, especially veterans. Test out a virtual reality pain management tool called Snow World. Josh demonstrates how it works. Looking through high-tech goggles, he launches snowballs at penguins and snowmen through an icy canyon. As Paul Simon plays, immersed in this Arctic environment, that triggers the memory of cold. Josh says he forgot about the painful daily cleaning and dressing of his wounds. It was the only time that I, I actually did not feel pain. The doctor says his study shows Snow World decreased burn patients' pain and the need for heavy pain medication. So a bit, a bit of science fiction there, but it's true. And the idea is that the impact happens in real time, sometimes uh, almost seamlessly or, or uh, unrelated to what the, the patient or the player is really doing. Um, in the case of the mental decline game that I mentioned, it's a racing game that seniors are playing and it affects their memory and other functions as a result. Um, so this is the first trend. The second trend, and again I'm staying on VR, is the idea that VR could be an empathy engine um, because of the immersion, because it takes us to other places. Uh, the, the, the piece that I'm going to show you is from a, 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 an experience called Clouds Over Sidra. It was commissioned by the United Nations. It takes you to a refugee camp. Think about it. This is not a shortcut. This is not like I'm taking you to a trip in Barcelona and instead of flying there, you're going to see it in VR. This is probably an experience that you, you won't have a chance to do otherwise. So this, I'll show you just a few seconds from how it looks. Obviously not in VR, but you there get it. There are more kids in Zatari than adults right now. Sometimes I think we are the ones in charge. Basically, the idea that this little girl is, is walking you around the camp, showing you her favorite spots, showing you how her brothers are playing video games or doing something else, and, uh, and getting you to, to visit, the, to, to experience it firsthand or virtually firsthand. 
Uh, I think this is just scratching the surface what we can do with empathy. If you want to check out, there is a very, very robust research done at Stanford by the VR lab on empathy, changing genders, identities, getting you to be in another age, um, getting you to be more altruistic as a result of a VR experience. Um, so this is just a bookmark here. The last one is sports, where Moran has started and introduced me. Uh, in the last two years, I'm doing more and more of that, more of the commercial work that I feel is also on the, going with that theme of pushing the boundaries of what video games are. I'm excited about eSports. By the way, this is Madison Square Garden, and I was part of the team that brought League of Legends for the first time to Madison Square Garden in uh, 2015, sold out in 24 hours. There are 10,000 people here, and it was two days, so 20,000 tickets um, to get all together. And what you see here is all the people that there are viewers, and there are only 10 players. So on the stage, you see five against five playing a video game. And on the screens that we usually see the NBA, we actually see a video game being played. I'll show you a 40 second movie so you kind of get what's going on there. <laughs> It's a really cool experience to have every person around you like the thing that you like. It really has changed my life. I absolutely love this game. It's, it's one of those games that whether we're having a good day or a bad day, we know if we play, we're going to have a good time and we're going to be better off for it. So you might ask why, why is it eSports, why it's even connected here. To me, it's the first time that video games in a big way break this idea that it's isolating or that it's done uh, in a room and you're doing it alone or that only this, the whole social activity is only virtual. Those guys are celebrating their passion and the people that play those video games as pros are excellent and amazing, just like the best chess players or the best athletes. There are 40 uh, universities in the U.S. already that are giving scholarships, uh, like varsity programs for video game players. And, um, and the other thing I'm excited about eSports is just like I'm excited about the positive aspects of sports in the Olympics, that maybe one day, going back to Peacemaker, we'll see a Palestinian team and an Israeli team uh, competing on that stage rather than in the conflict. Thank you so much.